So for the supervised algorithm, we have the maximum likelihood. This, is probably until, this was probably until uh, recently the most widely used method. And this, in this algorithm, the decision is based on probability. So each target class will be statistically described by, by what we call the multivariate probability density function. And there is an assumption that this function is a Gaussian, uh, follows a Gaussian distribution. And then each pixel will be compared to the, different, uh, to the different function. For instance, you have a pixel here. This is a simple example in only one dimension. But so you have this pixel here, and you can see that the probability that it belongs to the class B is higher than the probability that it belongs to the class A. And so it would be assigned to the uh, class B with a certain probability that gives you some confidence index to the classification. And for sure, you can work in more than one dimension. You can add several spectral bands and temporal dimension, and then the uh, distributions will become more complex. The main advantage of this algorithm is that uh, there is a full control of you. You, you can control totally the, the algorithm. You can, it is easy to understand why a pixel belongs to the class A or to the class B. And if you repeat the same algorithm in the same conditions, you are sure that you will get the same result which is not the case with most of the training, the other supervised uh, classification. The disadvantage is that the assumption that the density function follows a Gaussian distribution is often not true. And so when this is not true, your result can be questioned. And in terms of processing, uh, the disadvantage is that the same uh, set of features shall be used for all the classes. And so you can lose efficiency in your processing because it can become quite expensive. A second kind uh, of supervised algorithm is the artificial neural network. So here, the objective of this uh, algorithm is to mimic the human brain, which is able to uh, see and analyze a lot of uh, information coming from different sources and making link between these uh, data sets. And so the uh, neural network is uh, like what we call a connection of uh, artificial neurons. And this will, be, will make the link between all this information. Here, this is a very simple example where you have your input, your output, which are the classes of interest. And there is only one, what they call hidden layer. But you can add several uh, levels of layers. The advantage is that uh, this is much more accurate uh, when you have very large data set than the maximum likelihood. It also supports the fact that the distribution are not, uh, are not normal, do not follow a Gaussian distribution, so this is more robust. Um, and you can incorporate a, uh, a priori knowledge at some realistic uh, constraint uh, because you can give some input data that corresponds to your area of interest. The main disadvantage is that this is a, like a black box and it will be a disadvantage that will come back several times so here, this is very difficult to understand why a pixel is in class is in one class or in another one. Not the pixel that you know before the classification that this is wheat or that this is barley, but the pixel where you hesitate, the algorithm will tell you this is wheat. Okay, you have to trust it because uh, this is very difficult to understand the the, the story. Another kind of algorithm is the support vector machine. So this support vector machine is very popular. I think that with random forest, there are the two main ones that are used for the moment with some emerging, uh, new, new emerging ones. So this is a non-parametric statistical learning technique for solving a quadratic optimization problem. So basically, what it means, so you are working in an input space in a given uh, dimension, and you will, the algorithm will not work with all your training data sets, but only on the training data that are at the edges of the distribution. So the data that will help making the difference between the classes. It will localize these data in your uh, space, dimensional space, and it will try to define uh, the boundary. 
and this boundary then, based on the training data set, will be used to, uh, to classify all the, the pixels of your images. If it is not able to draw a good boundary, let's say, uh, then they will uh, increase the dimensionality of the space by a kernel technique, and then they will work on an, what they call hyperplan because it can, the number of dimensions can increase a lot. And at the end, you, you always have a boundary that will uh, discriminate between the land cover classes. So the advantage is that um, this is a, a method which is quite efficient when you have, uh, let's say, small or incomplete, small, small uh, training data sets. So if you do not have by uh, crop type many, many samples, this method is robust because it will really look at the edges and so it does not mind of the, 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 the full population of the, of the tra of training data set. So usually when you, if, if, you have a, if, you, if you have a training data, if you have many, many training data for the read, for instance, you will have a distribution like this. And if you have few training data, if the, your data set has been collected correctly, you will have a, a, high, a lower density here, but you still should have this representativity in terms of uh, uh, representative in terms of variety of practices. So when you have few training samples, you lose the density, but you, we can expect that you still cover the variety of the practices. And so the SVM is, is, is efficient in this case because it is only working with this kind of points in the distribution. The disadvantage is that if you have noisy data, these noisy data are there, typically. And so it will have a dramatic impact on the, on the, on the classification performance because you, will th you think that this is representative or this will allow to make the difference between a wheat and a maize, and in fact this is a cloud for instance, and so this is, this is very, very uh, sensitive to that. Another sensitivity is to the kernel function. I, I told you that uh, when you are not able to make, to define the boundaries in, in a certain dimensionality, we increase the dimensionality. The way we increase this dimensionality, if the kernel is not well used, we, uh, there is a high risk of overfitting or oversmoothing, uh, and so again, the quality, the performance of the algorithm will decrease. We move to another family, which is the decision trees. So here, I think this is uh, rather easy to understand. So this is quite hierarchical, and for each level, you decide, you have a, a, a criteria or rule that is tested, and then you decide uh, if you go uh, in one uh, decision, in, in one tree or in another one. So the advantages are very similar to the artificial neural networks. So under a lot of the um, measurements, uh, this is robust against the non-normal non, um, frequency distribution. It is really easy to apply. You have few parameters uh, and the structure is transparent and easy to interpret. So this is not a black box in this case. But uh, the disadvantage is that uh, when you have feature space with high dimensionality, this kind of decision tree, single tree, is very difficult to, to <coughs> handle that. And so uh, more and more researches a few years ago have been done in this uh, field of decision tree. And one of the, uh, let's say, result of this research was the random forest. Random forest is also, like the SVM, one of the supervised classification that is mainly used. So this is an improve, what we can say this is an improved implementation of the decision tree, meaning that in fact it will uh, test different decision tree and it, it will combine the results. So how does it, uh, how does it work? So for each, uh, they, they, will, they will in fact draw different trees with a random subset of your training data. And this is important to, to, to have it in mind. So you put your training data, and not all your training data will be used to build uh, your random forest model. So there will be a random sample that will be used. The other one are not taken. They will uh, do it several times with different random subsets, and then they will decide finally for your pixel 
the classes that is majoritary. So there is a majority vote between all the, the tests that have been done to decide the final label of your class. The advantage is uh, that, for instance, you can cross-validate the results because not all the data have been used for training. You can use the data that have not been randomly selected to make a cross-validation, so you get quickly an idea of the quality of your algorithm, which is nice. You can also use this information to uh, identify the discrimination power of the different features that you have used. Another advantage is that this is really easy to, to tune, so there are only two parameters. And the fact that it is more accurate than a classical decision tree because you combine multiple classifications. The disadvantage is also the fact that uh, it is combining a lot of classification uh, made by a random subset. And so uh, this random subset, this is random. Something which is also a disadvantage, and maybe I think for the cap, uh, this is a big, uh, big disadvantage. So in the, in sometimes there is the need to have something which is repeatable. You, can, you should run it several times, and you should get the same output at the end. With this random forest, this is not ensured because of these random, random samples that you do several times. And so for most of the pixels where the class discrimination is, let's say, rather straightforward, it will be the, it will be the same if you repeat. But for the pixels that are the most difficult to map, you may have different results if you run different times. Yes.